Hi, everyone. All right, so today is part two of our read aloud. So we are going to be continuing on with the tales of the water tower. And today's read aloud is the sequel to the water tower, written also by Gary Crew and illustrated by Steve Woolman. And it is called Beneath the Surface. So um, your procedures for today are the same as the other day. I would have opened the questions um, in a split screen with the recording so that as you're listening to the book and looking at the pictures, you're able to answer the couple of questions that I've put in for you today. Okay. All right. So here is Beneath the Surface. This is going to take us in the into the future. It still has the character of Spike, but he is now grown up and has returned to Preston. So this one is called Beneath the Surface. And our first picture just has a drop of water hitting, but I think that you might recognize, sorry, um, the circles that we saw so present in our first story. And it looks even like the words, like a rock has been thrown into this water. And so the words are even moving kind of in a circular fashion, kind of cool. All right, beneath the surface and we return to the water tower. All right. Nobody in Preston could remember when the water tower was built or who had built it, but it, there it stood on Shooter's Hill, its mighty section, stanch stanchions, plant, which are like the metal parts, planted deep within the earth, its long dark shadow stretching far across the valley, beyond Preston itself, far beyond. It's a great picture. Zoom in a little bit on that for you. All right, it says, from the minute he stepped off the coach, Spike knew that they were watching. Preston's small town. Preston's a small town, he told himself. I'm a stranger to them now. And picking up his bag, he headed for the hotel. So many years later, he has returned. And again, we have a water tower. Trotter, the reception clerk said when he said the name. There was a kid named Spike Trotter lived here once. No relation? Spike looked up from the register. Actually, my name, the name's Spiro Trotter, he said, avoiding the question. Dr. Spiro Trotter. You haven't come set, you haven't come to set up no clinic, have you? The clerk said, because I'm telling you now, no one's sick around here. No, sir. I'm not a medical doctor, Spike assured him. I'm a scientist. My degree is in hydrology. Now, if we look at the word hydrology, the first part of the word, the root of the word is hydro, which means water. Now, when the clerk asks, are you related to Spike? He doesn't say, well, I am Spike. He says, actually, my name is Spiro. So we have to assume or we can infer that Spike was his nickname growing up and probably still is. But his legal name is Spiro. And now he has become a scientist of hydrology. So would, if I were to break that word apart, I would say it's the science of studying water. Hmm like might be in a water tower. Ah, that's different then, because like I said, there's no diseases in this town. No, sir, no doctors, neither. Not since, I'm very tired, Spike interrupted. Can I have the key to my room? Anyway, that trotter kid shot through years ago, the clerk muttered, handing him the key. Him and his mother likewise, just up and left. Lost contact with him, we did. Good, Spike thought but said pleasantly enough, that's life. People move on. They change. They do. They certainly do. Clerk answered. Bit like towns, huh? And worlds, Spike thought, as he climbed the narrow stairs, even galaxies. He slept badly that night, his nightmares vivid and dreadful. So this is the next page. Creepy as this. I always figured that that must be what his nightmares are of. Maybe that's what he's dreaming. 
Hmm. Here's the next picture. This also has the little insets here. So you can see, I think this is Dr. Spiro. I think this is Spike. Back in Preston, recognize this building with the arches in the main downtown. And then we see these men studying things. He got up early next morning and slipped away. No, very, no sooner had he entered the street when he saw that the desk clerk had been right. True, the main street seemed the same. The hotel, the service station, the shop fronts. But there was something different about the place. Now a thick, chilling mist loitered at every corner, hung in every doorway, dripped from every sign. Spike couldn't remember any mist. That was not part of his childhood. Besides, how could there be in this dust bowl? And the scientist in him stopped to make a note. Remember those first, the first book, all of the pictures really depicted this place as extremely dry and how hot the boys were. And it was so, you know, scorching heat in this part of Australia where they were. And now there's this mist. So like a lingering condensation of water that seems to be hanging over the entire town. Kind of odd. Oh, we got a girl in a bathing suit. So all these people. And you can see the inset with Spike's face. I also want you to look very carefully at the girl's bottle of water. See if you see any symbols on the bottle of water that look familiar. At the base of Shooter's Hill, he stopped again. Sorry, I wanna make sure the image is in. It's harder to do this one than I think sometimes. There we go. Um, at the base of Shooter's Hill, he stopped again. The water tower had stood at the summit he remembered, a rusty egg-shaped monstrosity, its looming presence dominating the Preston of his childhood and enduring still, if only in his dreams. To see that tower again, to reaffirm its existence, and finally to analyze its contents was his mission. He raised his head but could make out nothing. The hill was wreathed in mist, and when he hit a security fence, his memory receded, memory reeled. Something's wrong, he thought. The fence was at the top. I've hardly started climbing and already I've hit wire. Unless this fence is new, which makes sense after 20 years, which means there's still something up there. So as he looks up at the hill to see the water tower that was there his whole childhood, he can't see it because there's this foggy mist that's hanging so low and the clouds are low, so they've like covered up where it was. And there's a lot of new fencing around it. But he wants to get up there and analyze the contents of what's in that water. So we have to think that he's still thinking about going in there with Bubba when he was a kid. So um, I'm going to have you answer your first question. What is Spike doing back in Preston? Okay. So we can't quite get to the water tower. Reassured, he backtracked until he found a gate. His hands roved over it, seeking a latch. He found a lock, a touch pad with lettered keys. Hopeless, he sighed, punching the pad with the flat of his hand. As he did, he heard the squeak of a hinge. The gate opened as if he were expected. The mist lifted the moment he stepped through, and there was the water tower at the summit his water tower, the place where he had played as a child, laughing and hallooing, swimming and duck diving in its dark waters. This is what he had come for. So there's a keypad on there that he shouldn't have been able to open, but he just bumps it and all of a sudden it opens, almost like they're inviting him in. So if we look at the inset here, first of all, you have this creepy girl in the water. And I want you to notice the pump over here, sorry going into that water. Is there any symbol on that pump that you can see? 
And then there we turn, so hard to do this backwards. If we turn, you can see the pump again, and we can see him looking up at the water tower with his sample box to collect some water samples. But as he drew closer, he realized that he was wrong. The tower of his childhood had been red with rust, rotten almost. This tower was bright and gleaming, as if freshly polished. What would they, why would they do that, he wondered, unless it's to keep the water cold inside. And he shivered, thinking of it, and of the dark. Just a piece of metal, he told himself. Always was, always will be. Now get up there and do what, get what you came for. All right, so we can see these farmers. And farmers, of course, would need a water tower to help with their crops. And so the water tower would be pumping water possibly to silos like this that would hold water. So he's determined to get up there. He made his way to the ladder and began to climb, but he did not remember it being so steep nor so high. And when he finally reached the top, the silvery surface looked so smooth, so slippery, that his courage almost failed him. What was he? What was there to be afraid of? Falling? Being pushed? So, the inset has him climbing the ladder. You can just tell he's a little freaked out. But I want you to look at these monks. Obviously not in Australia. But I want you to look at them. Look at their eyes. And a lot of students over the years have noticed over here the shape behind them that they saw also in the first story. Almost like a big fan of some kind. Leaving the ladder, he crawled to the center of the tank where he reached out to grip the handle of the access hatch. Then he paused, feeling better. He had arrived at last. Now to get in, he thought, and heaved. But the latch lifted easily. Maintenance, he wondered, removing a glass vial and a length of cord from his pack. Tucking them into his belt, he swung his legs over, located the interior ladder, and went down. Yeah. Close up with this page. Looks like guys working that might maintain the pipes. And then you have him up at the top here at the inset. It was dark inside and cold, even colder as he descended. He could re not remember the cold, nor could he remember the vapor that drifted on the surface below. But he went on, down, down, deeper into that murky dark. He felt the vapor lap at his ankles, his knees, his waist, his chest. When it reached his face, clouding his vision, he stopped. I don't like this, he thought. I'll take the sample from here. He took the vial from his belt and lowered it until it hit the surface and sank. He felt the cord tighten as the vial filled and lifted it free. Then he went up, eager to feel the sun. All right, so this shows almost like a girl's school somewhere. Look at their eyes. In the inset, we see him... Um, taking the vial down, but he feels this vapor kind of like that was outside all over him. Again, that's a change from when he was a kid. And again, in this image, we see this big circular thing behind character. I'm gonna pause now and I want you to determine what are some things that he notices that are different um, about the water tower, about the town since when he left. Okay. Our next picture. So notice, one thing that I notice as I read this is that it's traveling across the world. And so while we're seeing all these people in different cultures and different dress and different places, there are all of these things that are scarily similar that kind of freak you out a little bit. 
When he reached the top, he stood on the open hatch. When there, he said, I've done it. 20 years it took, but I've done it. And he held the vial to the sky. The water was clear. There was no sign of algae. He had hoped that he would find something, some explanation, some reason for his fear, his nightmares. So I'm going to zoom in on these people here, see if we can see anything that we think is important. And then on the inset, sorry, let's figure out the best way. Oh, wrong one. Ah, turn it around again. All right, so on the inset, we see him looking at the water, but it just looks like water. And I think that he's hoping that even just on the surface, without even testing the water, he'll see something. Okay, here's our next picture. Curious, he opened his kit and applied his test. Still nothing, not a microbe, nothing. All right, so now we've got these skaters, which could be anywhere in the world. I want you to look carefully at them, at their clothing, at their backpacks, and see, do you see any images that look the same? You look in their eyes. Anything about them? At any point now, you could pause. And I've put in two questions about what are three questions about what are you noticing about the pictures? What are you noticing about the people? What are some repeating images that you think you are finding? Hmm. Aquapira, he breathed reassured, the very basis of life. And raising the vial to his lips, he drank. One sip, they allowed him. One sip only. So he drinks the water you can see on the inset. Now, so this is a picture. All of these men, they look to be pretty important businessmen. I want you to see, we have again our repeating image on this binder here, and also on their lapel pins. So I want you to think, what do you think these men are? What are they trying to do? So he takes a sip of the water, and this is the next picture. So he takes a sip, which was both his end and his beginning. And that's how the story ends. So to end this, we are going to talk about it in class when you guys, when we're all there for Lit Circles tomorrow and everybody has read both of the books. Um, and so my last question that I'm going to put in today, so you have six on your page, um, is what do you think happened to Spike? And who are the men at the round table? Okay. And even though I can't say I have all the answers to these stories, there isn't even much out there on it. Um, I have some of my own thoughts and kids over the years have come up with some thoughts. So I'm anxious to see what you guys think. So I will see you tomorrow. Bye.